clock, so we're going to get started here. Um, I just wanted to, uh, let's see, this webinar series is uh, brought to you by SAIR. Uh, it's a grant from SAIR for this professional development uh, webinar series. And I want to make you aware of a couple more, since I can find my stuff here. Um, we have uh, two more coming up. Um, well, actually, we have three more coming up after today. Uh, in two weeks, we have one on irrigation efficiency, and then we've added a couple. Uh, we've got uh, one on life cycle analysis uh, for dairy production. So it's going to teach you what a life cycle analysis is, and then look at dairy production as a model. <clears throat> and then one I'm still uh, working on getting the registration stuff for is uh, one on anaerobic digesters for farm energy production. Uh, so we'll be sending some stuff out on that uh, hopefully shortly. Um, today our topic is, uh, is this thing one quit disappearing on me? Today our topic is uh, um, energy efficiency for dairy enterprises or milk production. And uh, we're going to take you through some of the more common ways to uh, we can save some energy on uh, dairy farms. So with that, one thing, you know, we always talk about uh, energy efficiency, or it actually used to be called uh, more of energy conservation, but that got to be a bad word. Uh, but, you know, to conserve energy doesn't necessarily mean uh, changing a lot of what you do. Um, sometimes it's just adapting to new technologies. So, you know, some of the things like uh, variable speed vacuum pumps, which are, are basically not as new as they used to be, uh, but are still new. Upgrading less efficient um, equipment. Uh, so if we have uh, the typical compressors or reciprocating compressor, we can um, convert those to scrolls when we need to replace one. Um, and the other thing would be to change um, management practices. So a lot of times scheduled maintenance work doesn't seem to get done. Uh, so updating to uh, uh, get that work done. So either scheduling it or contracting it out, possibly, if you don't have the time. The result is we want to save some energy, and in the process, we should save money. Uh, it basically doesn't get done unless it'll save money. Um, and one of the good things for most farmers who are very busy is that uh, most of this equipment or processes are, have low management requirements. So it's going to take you a minimal time once it's the equipment's installed uh, to maintain it. Uh, when's the best time to invest in energy uh, efficiency? It's basically, there's there's three main times when you're expanding. Uh, so typically, when you expand, you need larger equipment, or if you're remodeling, um, and then uh, when it needs replacing, it's burned out, uh, it's old. Uh, we, then if it's, a, if it's a case where we have to buy something, then the cost for going to enter something energy efficiency is basically the incremental increase in cost uh, above what you'd normally have to buy. But the bottom line here is it's not about sacrifice. It's about making educated decisions. So one of the things when we're looking at uh, energy conservation or energy efficiency is where to, where to look. And the best place to do is to, to find a chart like this so you know where your energy is used. Um, and then you can, can um, uh, look at where the big energy uses are. So in this case, it's milk cooling. Um, uh, it's, it's lighting, milk cooling, uh, vacuum pumps, uh, ventilation, and water heating. We get to things like feeding and manure handling. Typically, they don't run very much during the year. You know, it might be, for instance, feeding equipment, maybe it's a half hour day. Um, it tends to be a lower uh, energy cost on a, on a whole farm basis. And there's less energy efficient options in some cases. So it tends to be uh, um, not a whole lot we can do there. So we concentrate on, on where, where we can save the most energy for our uh, investment. One of the things to do to start with is to kind of look at a benchmark. So you, know, you get your electric bills out and you look at them. And 
if we're under 750 kilowatt hours per cow per year, uh, we're pretty darn efficient. And this is based on some work uh, done in New York State. Uh, and with vacuum pumps, uh, that's one of our bigger users. Um, 50 kilowatt hours per cow per milking per year. So if we're only milking one milking a year, it'd be 50 kilowatt hours. If we're milking three times a day, it'd be 150 kilowatt hours per cow per year. So that's kind of how that works. And then seven tenths of a kilowatt hour uh, per hundred weight of milk. Uh, so that means we're either going to have uh, some kind of a heat recovery or, or a, a high efficiency um, um, yeah, lost my train of thought. Uh, high efficiency compressor. Um, energy use on a farm is subject to scale. Uh, if we look at the, we have more cows, um, we basically typically use less energy. And this is looking at basically just electric, um, electric LP gas for water heating or natural gas or oil for basically the farmstead. Doesn't include field. Um, so what can we do? We're going to kind of look at uh, most of these things today. Um, we'll touch on ventilation and, and lighting, but that was basically covered by a previous uh, uh, webinar. So we're not going to concentrate on that too much. So refrigeration, what do we need? For most cases, we need to remove 56 BTUs per pound of, of milk to get down to storage temperature. Uh, so that means for a uh, uh, 80 pounds of milk, we got to take out 400 or 4,500 BTUs uh, per cow. Um, and we also have to meet the regulations. So the regulation requirement is typically that you got to cool it to about 42 degrees within two hours of the end of milking with a blend temperature of, of no greater than 50 uh, degrees on the second milking and beyond. Um, and, and basically, uh, for a typical cow, you, you got to cool 35 pounds, or yeah, 35 pounds of milk is could be cooled within an hour. Um, so you're gonna have 2,200 BTUs per hour per cow, uh, the minimum requirement for for duration. When we're milking um, long milk times, we basically have to milk uh, cool the milk as fast as it's produced. Um, so especially if we're doing a, a direct load to tanker, uh, that would be the case also. Uh, it has to basically go into the tanker cold. Um, with refrigeration compressors, there's two different kinds uh, typically have been used in the industry. Um, the one on your left is a reciprocating compressor. Uh, this has a piston in it, uh, much like a gas and lean engine. It's got a lot of moving parts. It's got pistons, it's got valves, of some sort to let refrigerant in and out uh, as it's being uh, compressed. The newer style compressor has a scroll. Um, so it works a little different. It's a continuous flow versus uh, um, reciprocating compressors, more of a pulse flow. Uh, and I'll get an illustration here in a second and we'll show you. But uh, scroll compressors typically can save about 15 to 20 percent in energy cost. Um, they're very reliable. Standard on most new systems, although if you get um, a large system, they may go to a rotary uh, compressor versus a, a reciprocating. Um, this is its proven technology. It's been around since the uh, 1980s, was implemented into the ag industry in about the mid-90s. Um, it actually dates back to a patent in the early 1900s, but they couldn't make them because of the precise nature of the machining required, except for onesies, twosies. Um, if you decide you're, you've got a reciprocating compressor and you want to convert, um, as long as the condenser system, so the heat exchanger uh, is well maintained, um, you can uh, replace it with a new scroll compressor that's within 5% of the um, uh, existing compressors capacity. It does require some new mounting holes and new wiring. And the incremental, the cost of compressors is almost identical these days. Uh, but the, there is some incremental cost from the wiring and, and 
um, adapting it to the current um, compressor unit. So you, you usually have a three to five hundred dollar additional cost, which you'll make up fairly rapidly with the energy savings. Uh, it, however, I should say it, it, it hardly ever pays to go out and replace a working compressor because they're typically not run enough hours a day uh, to make that advantageous. Here's an um, a illustration that tries to illustrate how these work. So you've got a scroll. The scroll does not spin. It oscillates. Uh, so this point is going to stay at this point, and basically it, it oscillates around the, around the point. So this edge here is going to oscillate down and around and then back up. And you can kind of see that as you, as you go to the different uh, pictures here, how it, how it comes around. So it's only showing one or two cavities filled. In reality, uh, all these cavities would be filled with, with gas uh, to give you an almost continuous flow uh, with these. So it's, it's a very precise machine parts. Um, and as such, they really couldn't be made in production until the computer age came along and we had computerized uh, CNC machines that were very accurate. Uh, condenser units are very important as far as uh, getting rid of the heat. Um, they uh, um, can be put inside or outside. Um, for putting them inside, we need some kind of way to ventilate. So in this case, we have a, a um, louvers that will open uh, to uh, exhaust the heat. Uh, because the higher the temperature that we're trying to uh, get rid of the heat at, the more energy it's going to take to do the cooling in that system. So the location is, is important. Uh, we can have them inside, um, which you know basically typically we're using for spacing when we have them inside. But we need to accommodate uh, uh, some way to get that heat out for the summer. Um, one advantage of putting them outside is that on a year-round basis, we usually have a lower reject temperature, uh, which will save us money. Uh, but we also may have increased maintenance because of debris and, and dust and stuff that uh, blows along the ground or that is exposed to. Although sometimes inside, it can be that way, too. Um, don't recommend installing them at ground level, because that's where a lot of your leaves and trash will come recommend getting them at least three feet off the ground um, so you avoid uh, some of that, that debris that would uh, reduce the airflow through these things. Um, here's one way you can, you can accommodate that. Um, your little uh, cubby hole you put on the outside of a building. Um, so these have, have doors here um, that you can, you can open um, or close depending on what time of year it is. Uh, to either vent the, the heat out or in inside the uh, uh, room. Here's another method over here to uh, make the cubby hole on the inside. So a very effective way to uh, get rid of the heat um, um, and, and uh, be more efficient. Uh, one of the issues that uh, is often overlooked on compressor units is the maintenance and the cleaning of them. Here's uh, two examples of some that I found in the field. Uh, the one on the upper right, you know, this was actually backed up to a wall, so you really couldn't see it unless you got around the back. So the air is going through in this direction. Um, so this is all cow hair and cobwebs and stuff that was on this. This, another, this other one on the lower right, that's from a uh, 1,200 uh, cow dairy. And basically, this is all dryer lint. Back over here, there was a dryer, and the, uh, the exhaust had broke off, and so it was venting all this lint into the room. So just an example. This, this isn't going to get rid of much, much energy um, without uh, pushing the, um, the uh, refrigerant temperature very high because of all that um, dirt. So one of the things we can do is clean it. We recommend it doing it twice a year. Uh, Make sure you undisconnect the power before you even start. Um, but this can save 3 to 5% uh, from cleaning alone, based on a study we did right here in Wisconsin. Um, 
and you you want to go out and to clean these properly, you want to go out and get an evaporator condenser cleaner. These units are put together. Um, these these are are aluminum fins, fins on here that are press fit to copper tubes. Um, and if you get any corrosion or dirt in that joint, you will uh, reduce the heat transfer uh, to that through that unit. Uh, so, one, it's recommended that you get um, um, uh, the cleaner because we know that won't corrode it. Um, the other is not to use high pressure washers because they will push the dirt into that um, that pressed fitting and you will again reduce the heat transfer from that. Uh, when you do this, you want to protect the, the, you typically have to remove the uh, the fan motor from this and swing it out of the way. And uh, if it's an open style motor, you want to put it in a bag or something. But typically, you're just going to uh, you rinse it with, with some hot water. Um, make sure it's in a place that it can drain. That's one of the issues we run into is they're not necessarily always in an area that's easy to, to clean them. Um, you mix up this, this uh, condenser coil cleaner with some water. You spray it on, let it soak 10 minutes, and you rinse it off. It's as easy as that. About 20 minutes, you can save yourself three to five percent. Uh, some of the other issues are to keep keep the opening in front of the uh, condenser unit clear, so you get good airflow. Uh, open those winter covers when warm weather hits. Uh, make sure any louvers um, work properly. And uh, once a year, get your your uh, your refrigeration uh, contractor or dealer in to check the refrigerant level. Because that's something that you you can't do without specialized equipment. Uh, next thing we can look at uh, for um, reducing our energy is to use a plate um, cooler or or some kind of a pre cooler. They can be plate or there's the old ones are tube and tube or a, a tube in a vessel. Um, the, these can uh, typically offset about 60% of your cooling cost. Uh, depending on your well water temperature, um, but they need um, a minimum water flow. So the minimum, if you do theoretically, you need about a one, one to one water to milk flow ratio in order to provide maximum cooling. Um, but most commercial units that are, are are sold require a two to one water to milk flow ratio, up to a three to one water to milk flow ratio. Um, to get that kind of flow rate, you need at least one inch water piping and a water system that can supply it. Because typically, we're going to need to get in the 60 gallon per minute uh, range of water flow to supply that kind of water volume. Um, not all systems can supply that, so we've got some other options uh, in those cases. Typically, it's only for short periods, so 20, 30 per seconds, whatever it takes for that receiver to empty. Uh, so it's not necessarily a long period of time, and then there's a, a rest period. But you have to have enough capacity, um, at least on a short-term basis, to supply that kind of water. Um, cooling is a function of residence time and surface area. Uh, so this can be the number of plates, the number of passes through a heat exchanger. Um, but it is possible to get that water or the milk down to within three to four degrees of, of the well water temperature. Um, we can use uh, solenoid valves to minimize the water usage versus letting it water run continuously. Um, but if we do use a solenoid, we need to put some water hammer resters on there because the solenoids close very fast, and uh, you'll get if you stop water suddenly, it'll it'll put lots of pressure on the pipes unless you have some place for that water that energy to dissipate, uh, which is what the water hammer arrestor does. Um, So the, the potential is 6% uh, savings. And one of the issues is we need to do something with that water. Um, you're, you're pumping it out of the ground. We don't want to just run it down, uh, uh, down the creek. Um, we'd like to reuse that. So one of the most common things to do with that is to water the cows, running it uh, back through the, the water system. Uh, the other way to do it is with uh, you can use it for clean up or wash down your parlor. 
Uh, when we look at flow rates required, this is one of the reasons I said you need uh, about 60 gallons a minute. The typical um, uh, milk pump is going to be in this three quarters to one inch, one horsepower range. So you're getting 60 to 70 gallons per minute to meet that two to one water to milk flow ratio. Um, so in order to do that, basically this is looking at the water flow you can get through a pipe based on 40 psi. Um, your one inch pipe doesn't quite get you there. You need a, a two inch pipe depending on the number of feet of run between the water source and your plate cooler. Uh, so typically you're going to be need to be in this inch and a quarter range uh, to get that kind of, of volume of water flow. Uh, in some cases that's not always possible and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, water temperature ranges, basically uh, pre-coolers are typically a, a single pass or dual or multi-pass and sometimes dual coolant. And um, so these are the, the rough ranges that the industry um, sees that you can get. Um, of course, if you have enough, enough, uh, enough surface area, enough residence time, uh, as I said, you can get it down to within three to four degrees of, of, uh, of the um, well water temperature. So reuse for water, uh, typically we see these storage tanks where you can uh, put the water in a storage tank and then um, have a pump to, to repressurize the system and some kind of a distribution either uh, going into the um, water pipe, water system to go out to the livestock waters or in a, in a pump to wash down the parlor, depending on how you do it. Um, these can be set up as potable or non-potable. Um, typically, they're non-potable because the requirements uh, get pretty um, fussy and expensive uh, if we try to make that a potable water source. And for the livestock, typically, you don't have to have a potable water source uh, for them, uh, especially for this type of use. Um, if we don't have enough water capacity, one of the options is we can use a variable speed um, milk pump or variable speed drive on our milk pump to reduce the milk flow. The concept of this is, is that we want to ramp the, the uh, milk speed up and down to maintain the, the milk level in the jar. So ideally, we want a very smooth, uh, slow flow of milk uh, through the precooler. Well, when we do this, we slow the milk flow down versus, uh, you know, typically we can we can cut the the speed down by uh, 25 to, to 25 percent of of uh, full capacity. So, you know, if we had a 30 gallon per minute um, pump, we're getting that someplace down around 78 gallons a minute. Well, most water systems can handle that and get your two to one water to milk flow ratio very easily. And sometimes you can actually increase it beyond that. Um, so slowing down the milk increases the, the water to milk flow ratio, uh, so you get more cooling of milk and reduced run time on our compressors. That's the payback to reducing the energy cost. Um, if we put a variable speed milk pump in versus not a variable speed milk pump, we will use more water, but that's because we're getting more cooling. And these units uh, typically replace the on-off liquid bubble control. Uh, sometimes they will have an override. If you are a farm that milks long hours, uh, you want to make sure you have a redundant system or a backup in case that variable speed drive uh, fails, because if it fails, you're done milking until you get it fixed. Um, so you want to have a backup there. Um, so variable speed milk pump. Um, is useful on water systems where we don't have enough capacity. Um, typically, if we add them to an existing system, we'll see 15 to 20 degrees of additional cooling, uh, but it does vary with installation. But some other things we can do, um, variable speed milk pumps probably in the $2,500 range uh, for one of those units installed. Um, but you know, some other things we might do that may be more cost effective would be to upgrade the water system. Um, Purchase an oversized pre-cooler so we get that increased uh, surface area and contact time, or add some more plates to our existing uh, plate cooler if the frame will allow you to do that. 
So those are some some other ways we can do it. Oh, and if you want to, this was uh, from my class where I teach a uh, little um, little math there. Um, water heaters. Um, one of the things with water heaters, the way they rate them, the industry rates them, is with a, a something called energy factor. And this accommodates the, the thermal uh, combustion efficiency and the standby losses. Um, one of the issues um, that I found remarkable when I started doing energy efficiency work is how much heat loss a standard water heater has. Standard gas water heater has about two and a half uh, percent loss an hour. So add that times it by 24, you get 60 percent loss a day out of that water heater. Um, electric is about one percent, um, so they're much better. There's been industry standards for electric water heaters, whereas there's been less standards for gas or oil water heaters. Um, so if we take a, a um, if we look at an electric water heater, um, the best energy factor is about 0.92, um, well, about 0.95. 0.92 or better, we'd consider high efficiency. Uh, the standard is probably about 0.85 with gas. Um, the best is about 0.77, and the standard is about 50%. So about half the energy you put into a gas water heater is going out the stack or out the sidewalls versus into the water. Uh, the good thing is we have third-party data. Um, the um, Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute publishes data. You can go online. Uh, it's by brand, model. You can look up the data. And, and get these values for for different um, water heaters. Some of the other things um, they call them heat traps or anti-siphoning. Most water heaters come with these now, but it keeps the um, hot water from siphoning thermal siphoning up the pipe. For instance, up here on top of the uh, water heater, uh, going up and and losing heat out the top of the water heater. Um, um, so energy factor is basically equivalent to an overall energy efficiency number, um, and we on commercial water on, on residential water heaters, it's published on them because they know the approximate range these things are used at. On um, on commercial water heaters, they aren't. So this equation uh, you can use to to get a, a comparison of water heaters. Um, they used to be rated in that um, rating system as a percent loss per hour. Nowadays, they are at a BTU loss per hour. Um, so if you compare the same tank size, you can just look for one with, with the least amount of, of uh, BTU loss per hour. The thermal efficiency range on most water heaters, unless it's a high efficiency one, is going to be 80%. Um, if you get a high efficiency one, um, they're going to be up above 90 percent, but that's typically. So if you, you can use this formula if you want to convert to an overall energy factor. Um, for uh, commercial, for dairies, they ought to be, you ought to be using a commercial versus a residential, and basically it has to do with the maximum temperature. Um, in most cases, we need to be around 160 degrees to get a, a milking system washed. And most residential models won't let you do that. Um, one way to reduce standby losses, if the the unit is sitting in a dry, rodent-free area, is you can go to a hardware store and get a a, a um, insulation blanket to wrap around the outside uh, to reduce your your heat loss uh, through the tank itself. Um, the other way we can do it uh, reduce our, our Heat loss is to feed these with a refrigeration heat recovery unit, um, or or use water directly out of the refrigeration heat recovery unit instead of out of the water heater for non-critical uses. So, for instance, washing down the parlor, um, you could use it directly out of the uh, refrigeration heat recovery unit when it's non-critical. These do require some maintenance. Uh, ideally, once a month you want to flush the drain, so they usually have a drain on the bottom. Open it up, take a five-gallon bucket of water out uh, to uh, get all the 
minerals and, and precipitated uh, minerals out of the bottom. One way we can save cost but not save energy is to switch from a primary to a primary fuel from electricity. Uh, electricity uh, is an expensive fuel uh, typically, um, and if we go to um, a primary fuel like propane or natural gas, maybe not heating oil so much anymore, um, but typically it's it's going to be a lower lower cost, and those uh, units typically have faster recovery um, as well. And then you can reduce the demand load, especially if you're on three-phase power. You're going to get hit with a demand load, and um, that'll reduce that charge that um, can hit you on a, on a monthly or yearly basis. Uh, next thing is a refrigerant heat recovery unit. They look like a water heater, so the blue unit here is a refrigeration heat recovery unit sitting next to the water heater. Um, and one of the things you note, the the piping comes right out of that and into the top of the water heater. So this is the cold water is coming into the bottom of this heat recovery unit, hot water coming out and feeding the water he water heater as preheated water. Uh, this shows an uh, illustration of what they look like. They have a, a, a um, heat exchanger that's wrapped around the tank. The uh, refrigerant will come in, uh, comes through this, this heat exchanger, um, is cooled in transferring the heat to the water, and the refrigerant um, basically is desuperheated. It's, it's still hot, but it's desuperheated to take some of that heat out of the, um, out of the refrigerant. These are usually urethane insulation around them, so they're usually uh, better insulated than, than some uh, hot water heaters. Um, so these uh, units uh, typically can recover 20 to 50 percent of the heat uh, from the milk. Um, they can typically accommodate one to two uh, compressors, and they will increase the efficiency of the refrigeration system 25 percent or so. Um, compared to not having one. Um, the, uh, typically, on a year-round basis, you got to get uh, 100 to 120 degree water out of these things. So typically, we figure you're going to replace about 50 percent of your water heating needs. Now, during the summer, you might not have to do hardly any heating, because if your reject temperature is 90 degrees, you're going to get pretty hot water out of that. During the winter, when it's cold, maybe not so much. Um, so it just depends. If you're on a smaller dairy, oversizing this heat recovery tank will reduce your your um, your savings. And the reason why is because you've got X amount of BTUs put in the water. If I spread it over more water, I'm going to have a lower increase in the temperature increase versus. So the biggest tanks are 120 degrees. Uh, so they go 120, 80, and 50 is the typical size of these tanks. If I, you know, put a um, 100,000 BTUs in a 100, um, 120 gallon tank versus a 50 gallon tank, I'm going to get twice the temperature increase in that 50 gallon tank. Actually, a little more than twice in that 50 gallon tank than I will in the 120. So the more the increase, the more you offset. So, you know, if you only use 50 gallons of, of water per milking, then then you know maybe a 50 or 80 gallon tank is is as big as you want because if you went to a 120 gallon tank, uh, you won't get the temperature increase in that water. Um, maintenance wise, these have the same issues that a hot water heater tanks, uh, and they should be flushed. So if you hook up uh, and use some water out of them daily for some of those non-critical uh, cleanup needs, that's one way to to uh, take care of that. Um, so when is it economical to use a heat recovery unit? Typically, almost any time we have an electric hot water heater, it's almost always uh, cost effective because of the higher cost of electric versus other fuels. Um, but one of the things we may want to do, too, is to look at how we can reduce our amount of hot water used uh, to do that. So one thing is to replace hot water with the preheated water out of the heat recovery tank. The other is to come and tune up the, the um, pipeline wash system. Um, very often we run into cases where 
um, somebody was having problems getting these cleaned, and what they did is they they decided to add more water to the system, and it's a case where they probably need to balance the air admission um, uh, to the amount of water used to get get uh, them to wash properly. So sometimes getting your dealer to come in and, and uh, tune up the system uh, can pay dividends long term on saving hot water. Uh, the other issue with um, economics of these things is how much water milk you produce. If you're a dairy that only produces 50, 50 pounds per cow per day versus one that produces 90 pounds per cow per day, um, the 90 pound is, of course, going to have, get more heat recovery because you have more milk uh, to recover the heat from. Um, so that's, that's the case. But as I said before, typically we're going to replace about 50% of our water heating needs. Now, pre-coolers and heat recovery units are competing technologies. Um, if we pre-cool the, the milk with well water, then there's less water available for heat recovery uh, from the refrigerant because the refrigeration, there's less cooling to require. And when we put these two together, we don't necessarily get two units of energy savings depending on the size of the farm. Typically, what we find is that farms under 100 cows, um, it's typically only um, cost efficient to use one or the other, not both. And typically, water heating needs, if you remember that first slide I showed you on, on where we use energy, I think uh, water heating is about 20, about a quarter of the, the energy use. Um, so um, it's actually a little more than, than milk cooling. So that's typically the best first investment. When we get above 150 cows, then it's typically economical to have both um, pre-coolers and heat recovery units. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is when we look at water heating, where you know if we have a gas hot water heater, we got two units of energy in, we get one unit of usable energy out, so they're only 50% equipment efficient. We look at milk cooling. We have to decrease the temperature by 60 degrees, and a refrigeration unit is about 200% efficient. So for two units of one unit of energy in, I get two units of energy out or moved. Um, so they're much more efficient. Um, and then we have this increase in the efficiency of the the um, refrigeration system itself, um, so that that. Uh, um, it'll increase the efficiency, so we increase that efficiency from, oh, probably about 25% in most cases. Um, so we get 225% um, efficiency. So kind of wrapping all these things together, I get this pictorial. So here's uh, milk from the cow up here. We could use a variable speed milk pump to regulate the milk flow through the pre-cooler and into the bulk tank. Once the milk's in the bulk tank, we're going to use a refrigeration compressor to cool it. Um, the refrigerant, uh, the hot refrigerant out, we're going to send through a refrigeration heat recovery unit. And then it will go to the air cooled condenser to get rid of the heat that is still left in the, in the refrigerant. And then it returns back to the uh, compressors to uh, be recirculated. Um, we're going to bring water into our heat recovery unit to preheat it, and the heat will come out and go into our water heater to supply our hot water needs. Uh, so that kind of shows a pictorial of how these pieces interact together. Uh, next up is looking at vacuum systems. Uh, we need vacuum to uh, um, create a pressure differential to pull the milk out of the cow. Typically, these systems are regulated with a pneumatic system, where the um, well, the the vacuum pump runs at continuous pace, and we dump air into the system to offset what is not being used by the um, milking units to maintain a vacuum level. With a variable speed unit, uh, we basically adjust the vacuum level by adjusting the motor speed. So we're if we don't need the vacuum, we're going to slow down the, the motor speed. And these things can react quick enough 
to regulate the vacuum within the, the requirements um, set up by standards. Uh, typically, we're going to save about 60%, although the, the range can, depending on the size, your, your, how oversized your system is now will depend on the uh, savings. Uh, the 80% is often when we have two or about 10 CFM per milking unit or, and often have two vacuum pumps, we can shut one down and just use, use one. Um, often we get better regulation because we have more adjustability with a variable speed control. With a pneumatic system, all we can do is adjust the vacuum level. They're basically preset. With a variable speed electronic system, we can use PID control and um, often get better control if they're set up correctly. Um, the uh, size of the vacuum pump remains basically the same compared to the conventional regulator. Um, and basically, sometimes it can, uh, it can account for being oversized. However, sometimes if we do have oversized pumps, the savings is reduced. And one of the issues is typically we're only using about two CFMs per milking unit um, to run that milking unit on a continuous basis. Um, so, you know, if we have 10 CFMs then on our system, then 80% of it's getting dumped. Um, another issue is that these vacuum pumps need to run it at a minimum uh, RPM, uh, basically for lubrication and cooling. Uh, if you don't have enough air going through them, then they can overheat. The same goes for the electric motor. They can go down about 30% of rated speed before they can uh, have problems with overheating. So if we do have them oversized, uh, pump head sometimes it's best to just replace it with a smaller pump head uh, so that you can run the, the motor with down to about that 30% uh, speed. Uh, a blower type vacuum pump works best, although you can do it on a rotary vane. Although the save, you can only run those down to about 50% of a rated speed uh, before you get cavitation. Basically, what happens is this, the um, the the pressure that the veins are are being thrown out against the housing isn't enough to hold it there, and it'll start jumping. And when it does that, it makes a hell of a racket. Um, the components of a variable speed system: you need the controller, variable speed controller. Uh, a lower blower pump. Um, you need a pressure transducer, which is basically put on the pipe right above the uh, receiver. You need a three-phase motor, and you can use three-phase or single-phase electrical input. So you don't necessarily have to have three-phase power to your farm to use one of these. It, the inverter or variable frequency controller will convert from single-phase to three-phase if that's what you have. So here's an example of a variable speed unit. Uh, this is the airflow. Um, so this is actually him attaching the milker unit, uh, milker attaching units to cows. So here's a set of five units put on and a set of four units, and then there's a lag time before the next side is done and put on. So just an example of, of what they can do. Economically, uh, if you're three times a day milking, uh, these units um, usually pay for themselves, um, but this is, shows it based on, this is 10 cents a kilowatt hour, probably need to update this. Um, but typically, if you're in the six to eight hours of milking per day, um, that's when they start to, to, to pay for themselves uh, economically based on a, a five-year payback. And very often, uh, your electric utility will have rebates for these, uh, either based on a kilowatt hour saved or demand load reduction. Um, vacuum pump sizing, as I mentioned in the past, uh, we've, we had ratings of over uh, 10 CFM per unit, uh, which is way over. At one time, more was better. Um, however, science came along, and uh, we found that basically this is a requirement today, or this is the requirement is you have 6 tenths of an inch of, of vacuum variation max at the receiver jar. In order to get that, typically it's 35 CFM per unit or per system plus 3 CFM per unit 
up to 32 units. And this 35 CFM, basically that's the equivalent uh, air um, emissions of one unit drop off. So if you have um, a system that has um, a large diameter milk tubes on your, your uh, milking unit, that may have to be increased. But that's, that's typically what uh, can be, be done. So we go over, um, over 32 units, then uh, basically it jumps um, the CFM unit because you're going to more than often have uh, two, um, two operators. And what, um, what research has shown that the maximum vacuum pump size we need is about 150 CFM because you hardly ever have all the units on it at any one time. Uh, some of the things we can do if we have an oversized pump, one is to downsize the pump head, the other is to change the pulleys uh, to reduce the, um, basically the, the amount that it takes per revolution. Uh, we had uh, talked about uh, um, uh, ventilation in a previous thing, but I thought I'd uh, touch on this. Uh, basically, all fans are not created equal. Um, one of the good things is we have uh, independent test lab, best labs that um, that uh, test fans. And when we look at that test data, you can have a factor of two difference between the same size fan for the same application, basically. Um, the energy efficiency unit we use for fans is CFMs per watt, so air move per unit of electrical energy. And um, basically the difference between a, a high efficiency fan and a low standard fan basically is about 20% when we, when we sort fans out. So typically we're looking for fans in the upper 25% of the all fans tested um, as a recommendation. One of the things that will increase uh, the efficiency of fans is diffusers. So that's these cones, this cone that sticks out here on these. Um, that will increase the fan efficiency. Air uh, doesn't mind being speeded up, but it hates being slowed down. It's kind of the layman's term. So these um, are at an angle as they come out um, and allow the air to, to uh, slow down a little bit before it's, before it's uh, um, released to the atmosphere. Typically, when we're looking at fans, we want to find one that's um, for exhaust fans, 21 CFM per watt at uh, 0.05 inches of water uh, static pressure is uh, what my minimum recommendation is for basically a 36 inch fan or bigger. So here's, uh, here's some of that fan data. We graph this over a whole bunch of all the ranges. Um, so here's some, some uh, target numbers. Um, you can see this is, uh, this is based at, at a higher static pressure at uh, 0.10. Um, you can see at this pressure, we're going to want to be about 20 CFM per uh, watt or higher. And of course, you can also see as the fan diameter gets bigger, the fan gets more efficient. So whenever possible, we'll go to a larger size diameter fan. Um, so the other uh, thing is to um, install these away from the prevailing wind whenever possible. That's not always possible, but if we can. And the other thing we can do is we can, we can use this fact that larger diameter fans are more efficient, and um, we can put a variable speed fan on a, on a, on a large fan and uh, slow it down for winter and speed it up for summer. Uh, basically, have it, have it run on a temperature control. So here's um, um, some inf or, uh, contact information with Best Lab. They have information online. You can get it online, or you can buy a booklet that has the fan um, ratings. They also do circulating fans, um, which I'm going to talk about next. So circulating fans are fans that move air around in a building. Um, they can be a panel fan like this or a basket fan, uh, either way. And the ratings for these are a little different. Um, because we don't have an enclosed area where we can measure the CFM easily, what they've decided to do with this rating is it's a pounds of force thrust. So if I put this fan on a lever, it's how much, how much force this 
fan tries to push back on a, on a lever. So it's pound force per kilowatt or per, per motor size or the amount of energy it draws. And then the other thing is we come out here five fan diameters and measure the airflow. So you can kind of get a picture of what the airflow is on that fan. Um, so thrust is proportional to airflow. So the higher the thrust, the more air it's going to, going to move. Um, here's a graph of, of the different size fans. And one of the things you, you can see here is that these are both 36-inch fans, but there's a jump. The difference is these have no guards. These have guards. So whenever possible, you'd rather have the fans without guards. But what that means is you have to get them up above uh, an area where humans or animals can, can uh, reach those fans uh, for safety re reasons. Um, but this also uh, shows that you need to keep those baskets. Uh, if you have a grab a guard on, you need to keep them clean um, because any, any debris on that will reduce the airflow uh, through the system. So as I said, guards will affect airflow. Blade design will affect airflow. Uh, the gap between the housing and the, and the blade tip. Um, the shape of the entrance. Um, if the entrance is square, it's going to have more of a pressure loss than if it's got a rounded corner. Um, motor location, uh, if it's in the center of the fan, it'll have less of an issue than if it's offset. And the speed of the fan can affect airflow. And faster doesn't always mean that it's going to be more efficient. Um, the other uh, type of mixing fan that's um, oh, it's been out 10, 15 years now is um, what they call an HVLS fan, high volume, low speed fan. These are basically large uh, ceiling fans. Uh, this is a picture of them down the center of a freestyle barn. Um, they can be put there. Or they can be put over top of, of uh, the pens. So typically in a three-row barn, we put them over the top of the pens. On a um, six-row barn, they typically put them down the center. And this is probably more for, for cost reasons, because these things are about five dollars $6,000 a piece. Um, they're much more efficient if you can put them over top of the cows, because one of the issues we run into is by the time it pushes all the air uh, through this distance, uh, basically it pushes a plume down to the floor, and then the plume goes out to the side radially. Uh, with obstructions we have in barns, uh, sometimes that airflow um, is pretty low in velocity by the time it gets out there very far. Um, the rating on these things is a 24-foot fan, fan will move about 300,000 uh, CFMs, and they typically have a two-horsepower motor on them. As I said, they typically hand down the center of the barn on 60-foot spacing. And some of the advantages that um, people have, have observed is drier floors, less bird traffic, and less flies, probably because of drier floors. Um, the Disadvantage somewhat is payback, although paybacks have, have come way down. Uh, you can cross out seven years. It's probably down about three or four now um, with, with a difference in costs of, of different kinds of fans. Um, and there has been some research on cow response. Um, one of the things that's a lower, usually lower velocity, and the few studies that have been done have found that um, the cows in high HVLS fan areas usually have higher body temperatures than ones that are in with high speed fans. Um, so depending on your climate as to how much of a issue that can be uh, during a heat event. From an energy standpoint, um, these things do save energy. Um, if we do a comparison, we have 48 inch fans every 40 feet. That's the recommended spacing. Typically, we're going to put two rows of fans per pen. So if we had a uh, double-sided barn, we'd have four rows of, of, uh, of uh, fans. Um, each of those 48-inch 48 48 inch fans will have a one-horsepower motor uh, versus, versus one HVOS fan. So in the 60 feet we have um, in that, 
we'd have the equivalent of, of four to six um, uh, fans in that area. Um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I'm assuming a double-sided barn for this. So in that area, we'd have have uh, four rows of fans, and we basically cover the 60 foot. We'd have uh, one at 40, one at the beginning of the barn, one at 40, and the next one would be at 80. So this area between the HVLS fan is covered by one and a half, and the other half would be in the next area of that next HVLS fan. So we have the equivalent of about um, six fans um, per cross section. Many of the companies advertise the equivalent of, you know, 13 or 14 fans, and that's basically we we don't usually set the barns up that way, so that's not a fair comparison. Um, but if we do this comparison, um, we're going to save about um, 4.3 kilowatt hours per hour of operation if we ran those equivalent fans the same amount of time. Um, from any fans, um, you know, especially exhaust fans, we want to keep the brush away from them. We want to lubricate louvers and stuff. Um, basically, from a maintenance standpoint, if louvers aren't opening, you're not going to get airflow. Uh, you can reduce airflow by 40%. Um, clean guards and belts, uh, that affects airflow. Uh, loose belts, 30% uh, reduction before they start slipping it endlessly. I recommend buying fans with with uh, self-tightening devices or retrofit your fans with self-tightening devices. Uh, we want to clean the dirt off motors so they cool properly. Uh, if the motor runs hot, it will reduce the life of that motor. Uh, all motors should be totally enclosed. That's required by electrical codes. Um, in an exhaust in an exhaust basis, we want to make sure we have clean air inlets so that the air flows properly and the inlets are working properly. And provide dust off of thermostats. If the thermostat's regulating the fans and it's covered with dust, uh, it's not going to sense temperature as, as fast or as accurate um, because of the insulation value of that dust. Um, uh, water, water farms. I like this picture. This was a, from a neighbor's farm. Um, these are an issue because of electrical safety. Uh, water fountains are notorious for stray voltage issues, especially when under this kind of condition, and energy efficiency. Even if this cover was closed, there's absolutely no insulation in this this water uh, fountain. So you're going to have high electric costs uh, because of that. So the recommendation is we can use energy-free or frost-free livestock water fountains. Um, you know, if we had a well-insulated unit, we we might save sixty to hundred dollars a year. But a poorly maintained unit, it might be two or three hundred dollars a year, uh, or maybe more. Um, that we could save in energy costs. The other advantage of these units is we can use them out in the pasture, uh, where we can, where electrical run might be be further than we'd uh, like, at least economically. Um, these do require a certain number of animals to, to, to use them because part of the reason they can uh, not freeze is because the amount of water, water, uh, new water being brought in that's warmer. So they're not suitable for you know small numbers of animals like you know maybe five or ten. Uh, you have to size them correctly for the number of animals that are going to be used. Um, you can put a thermostat in them with a low wattage um, heater. Uh, but typically they're not required. There's been research studies uh, back in the 70s and 80s when these things were first coming on the market in Canada and North Dakota, and they all performed ex except acceptably without heaters. Um, but in sub-zero weather, they do require maintenance much the same as regular water would because these balls um, can get frozen, or some of them have lids. I don't have a picture of one with a lid, but they can um, get frozen. So sometimes you have to do a little bit of maintenance that would be the same as required with a standard water. Um, if you have an electric water, uh, some of the issues there you can do is to um, make sure the thermostat's set low enough. It should be set below what the, the water 
temperature is coming in. So if you have 50 degree water coming in, it needs to be set down maybe 40 degrees so it doesn't click on every time somebody drinks from it. Um, that will save you energy in that regard. Um, and um, make sure that the, uh, the, the base of it is insulated uh, as, as well as can be. And that the base of these, you want to make sure the base is sealed uh, to the pad. Usually they're on a concrete pad, sealed to the pad, because if you get air leakage under these, that will help them freeze up as well. So here's a, a typical installation with these uh, energy free waters. You'll have a tube in the ground. Um, it's an insulated tube that goes down below the frost level where the water comes in. So these are typically 14, 18 inches in diameter, uh, insulated on the sides. Um, so the water will come up underneath. It also brings some ground heat up into the cavity underneath it. Um, you need to have it sealed around the base here. Um, and then if we bring in electric service, it would come up from underneath as well. Um, uh, the other thing I want to hit on is, is lighting technologies. Uh, it's a, it's actually, lighting is a low-cost um, place where you can save energy. Uh, so I want to replace the old technology, the incandescent bulbs. Um, they're actually being phased out here in the US. Um, you can use a, a halogen light, which is this type, or they come in, a, in the A type with this type of fixture too. Um, but we have much better technologies. We've got um, linear fluorescence, uh, compact fluorescence, or direct replacement. You can screw them in. Or the other thing that's coming in the market uh, very rapidly is LED lights. And I predict in five to 10 years, that's going to be the main light source. They are more expensive. Um, but they last much longer. Uh, some of the fluorescent type tubes, uh, LED type replacement tubes, have lives over 100,000 hours. Uh, you know, basically, you're going to be buying a light, uh, a light fixture that's going to last 20 years without replacing a bulb. Uh, if we've got the um, T12 fluorescents, which are an inch and a half in diameter. These are the type that. Uh, if you've got the standard variety, when it gets less than 50 degrees, they hardly light and they flicker. Um, they can be replaced with a T8 or T5 type light. Um, those are, are, are a little smaller diameter. It's, it's basically the, the, the T, the number after the T has, is the eighths of, the eighths of diameter. So 8 eighths is one inch in diameter. That's how they rate them. Um, the other type of, of light we can do is a incandescent induction, I'm sorry, induction light, which is a type of a fluorescent. But these here, uh, the linear fluorescents, they have an electrode inside here. And that's usually what burns out and makes the lamp fail. Um, what the induction, it's a bulb I have here, they basically have a magnet around the outside to induce the electrical uh, flow through this. Um, so there's no. Um, there's no electrodes to, to uh, fail. It needs to have a life of about 100,000 hours, um, along with the LEDs, um, which also have, have, can have life up to 100,000 hours or more. The other is when we look at uh, wide area lighting or high intensity discharge lighting, that's HID, high intensity discharge lights. Uh, mercury vapor lights are being phased out. The uh, ballasts are no longer available. And uh, I'm not sure the bulbs are even available anymore. So those, when they fail, you're going to need to replace them with a high pressure sodium light or metal haloid. High pressure sodium or a yellow type light, a um, metal haloid, which would be twice as efficient as a um, mercury vapor, have a very white light. Um, the other, you can replace them with a induction type light or an LED. Um, so those are the choices there. But very low cost way to um, uh, to update or save some energy with lighting. So that uh, that actually concludes my uh, presentation for today. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. So you can either uh, talk, and I should be able to hear you. 
uh, if you've got a mic on your computer, or you can uh, type a type a message in. I will be uh, sending out a um, sending out a, a valuation later in this afternoon with the recording. So if you want to see it again, um, you're welcome to do that. I think we have one question coming in here. Let's see. What are my thoughts on deep well variable speed pumps feeding the parlor? Uh, well, <clears throat> I guess one thing to look at is is um, the variable speed drives work wherever you have a varying load. Uh, so yes, with a parlor, if you've got a varying load, uh, that may be a good use. Um, um, so yes, they they can they can work. Um, basically, uh, you get with your um, 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 plumbing or electrical people, and they can uh, set you up with something. Uh, there are variable speed um, drive units that are on the market. Any other questions? Well, I'm not seeing any, so I will uh, call it a day. If you've got uh, other questions, you can um, uh, email me and I'll try to respond to you. Thank you.